moment I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of
in the sense of everything else today that no matter what storm we go through no matter how dark it seems no matter how hard it gets no matter how empty we feel no matter how lonely we feel no matter how tough it seems Christ is enough I don't know what it is, where it is, what's going on in your life this morning, but I want us to sing this song of declaration by faith. Because when we sing that Christ is enough, everything else takes its order. You may have came in here this morning heavy. You may have came in here this morning empty, broken. You may have came in here this morning thinking this is it. If I don't sense God today, it's over. You may have came in here this morning and said, I just need a word from God. I need reassurance. I need convincing this morning. Oh, the Spirit of the living God is here. Amen. And He's leading us into the presence. And there's no greater statement of faith than we can sing. By singing, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Come on, church, I want us to declare this this morning. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Everything I need is in you. 
the world all over. I've tried, I've bought, I've looked for every source, I've looked for every solution. But I've come to the conclusion this morning that Christ is all I need. That Christ is enough for me. Lord, we love you this morning, God. We are just so blessed with your presence. Be glorified, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are welcome in this Somebody shout hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Come on, somebody shout thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats this morning. Praise the Lord. It's great to be with you guys this morning in person and also online. I don't know about you, but can you sense the presence of the Lord yeah. here this morning? Can you sense his yeah. presence? You know, something takes place in the atmosphere when we declare Christ as King and Christ as Lord. Darkness has to flee. Yes. Demons tremble. Yes. Things begin to take its shape and yes. take its order. Our spirits are lifted and encouraged. Their eyes begin to lift up to heaven. Our hands and our knuckles stop scratching off the floor. <laughs> that we're encouraged and we're strength, uh, strengthened and our faith is strengthened also. I just want to take this moment just again just to welcome everybody in person and also everybody who is watching online. Guys, let's give everybody who's watching online a, a great big hand clap this morning. You're very welcome uh, to watch us online and we hope and pray that you also can sense the atmosphere of what God is doing here in the sanctuary. Uh, God's doing something amazing here and we want to encourage you that if you're not here this week, uh, if it's for sickness reasons, we're going to pray for you. If it's for other reasons, we want to encourage you to try and get into the presence of the Lord here in the church. The difference between watching at home is this. You watch a football match at home, you get a good game. You there, If you're there in the stadium, man, you can sense the atmosphere. You're there with the people. You get some good food as well, but you enjoy the presence. And so uh, I was watching the Scotland game last night. Congratulations to Scotland. <laughs> watching in the house man but I would have preferred to have been there but I, 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 wanted, I wanted to be there and sing I can boogie but uh, the place was rocking it really was uh, but that's the difference from being in person to sitting watching it on the couch there's so much difference that takes place uh, but you are welcome and also just uh, any first time visitors this morning any first time guests here for the first time just raise your hand we want to welcome you God bless you God. welcome God bless you and uh, just hang around afterwards. We've got some food and drinks and stuff. We get to know you and say hello. And I uh, also just want to say hello to my, my brother here as well. Welcome back. This is his second week. God bless you. Hey. Also, Charles and his family here that have traveled up. God bless you this morning, guys. And then what I want us to do right now, just turn around and just welcome someone. Just wave. Say hello. God bless you. Good morning. Hello. hello. Amen. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're one family this morning. We're one family this morning in the house of the Lord. And you know, before we continue with the service, I don't know about you, but if you, if you can remember last Sunday, we weren't here. The Penman clan weren't here. Uh, and so we were in Loch Ness. And we were hunting Nessie. <laughs> Unfortunately, we never found them, and uh, but we were up there, and we were up there for a good cause. Uh, last week, I was up there, I was running the Loch Ness Marathon, and 
Uh, I just sorry. I, I have something in my pocket. I, I just wanted to show you guys. <laughs> oh, 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 hey. That's gonna go in my collection. <laughs> that is marathon number four. Wow. And so to God be the glory, amen, that I can run and raise finances for God's kingdom. And I want to just give the shout a great big uh, uh, the church a great big shout right now because I believe all all in all in total somewhere that as a church we have raised over two thousand pounds for one. <laughs> So that's all going to go into the pot so that we can run a home here and just build up a, a, you know, a ministry here that glorifies and honors the Lord. And I want to just take this moment and just publicly before the church as well and just honor the team uh, that took the service last week. Guys, we just want to say we thank you. We honor you. I know you, I know, I know you guys felt the weight. You felt the responsibility. <laughs> No, but to everybody, to everybody who was here last week that, that took the place, that fulfilled the role, Amen. That they felt the weight, they felt the responsibility, they felt the stress. I mean, the the blessing. <laughs> uh, but praise the Lord, God's raising up a church. Amen. And it's a great, great feeling for Zoe and I as the senior pastors to know that we can go and that the church can still take its place. And uh, actually, I heard, I heard last week that it was packed and you guys do great service and. I even heard, I think I even heard somebody say, you know, Pastor, you don't even have to come back. We've got <laughs> well, how many know we're back because we love you guys, man. We love yeah. you guys. And uh, but uh, at this moment, maybe the kids can be dismissed into the into the, the kids' gang. The, the, my wife's there, she's going to take the kids into their time of ministry as well. Um, the kids are going to get ministered to in victory if you don't believe in uh, in babysitting. Yep. We believe in raising up a generation and in the faith. Amen. So they're going to have fun. We're going to have fun learning about the Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to deposit some stuff into the kids this morning. But at this point, I just want to call up Sister Nancy and she's going to uh, take up our offering this morning. Let's welcome Nancy. She comes up this well, just to bring an important part of the meeting is tithes as well and offerings. Now, some of you new to the God, you don't understand about tithes and offerings, that's no problem. Just speak to us and we'll do. But we believe in building the kingdom and building the house of God. And I was thinking about when you go into Genesis and you look and you get to Moses and you start to see them building a place for God's presence to rest. Because there's one thing God wants is to live with his people. And so they made a tabernacle. Now, to make that tabernacle, they had to have gold and jewels. Now, imagine we came to you and said, would you put your diamonds and rubies in here and bring your gold and put them in? You were like, oh, no, no. So what I'm saying is this is the time to build the church. And not only that, we want to align with God. Yeah. We want to be obedient. We want to say, what are you wanting me to put in? Extra as well as normal. So we may not have been faithful, that's okay. We can turn around. Amen. So I'm just going to show you this how high this. Anyway, <laughs> I think small, I've shrunk speak. by the real day, just shrunk me. But anyway, that's another story. But this is the envelope that you'll find, right? And I'm just going to speak about that envelope as a for my own sake I've, you can see it's all mapped out. <laughs> so we've got the tithes which is your normal giving. So take that if it's your tithe, so that we know that's your tithe. And if you're just putting an offering in, take that as offering. And if you're putting the two of them in, hallelujah. <laughs> right? And then just put the, the um, just put the amount in, but it doesn't matter. If you're like me and you can't count, you need a calculator, don't worry about it. Just, just put it in, we'll count it. Now also, put your name and address and that and that as well. And you're, and all, and you're at the postcode, obviously. And also, you can pay by cash, which most people do, and you can pay by, pay by card. So, and you can pay by check. Get your checkbooks out. No many do that now. But so I wanted as well, we'll be speaking later about this little card that sits on your chairs every week. Now, those who have learned to Zoom, you can now learn to do another technical thing. You take your phone out, 
two. Uh, take a picture and a wee square will come up and you line it up. You see that wee thing in the middle, that wee squarey thing? <laughs> you line it up with that. This is all the things I've had to learn, I'll tell you. And I'm 60 plus, so come on. Never, so, never, never. <laughs> so then you just focus in it with a wee square. Click, it'll even click itself and a wee sign will come up the top. You click that and up will come the website for Victory Outreach Glasgow. Wow, technology, amen. Also, you, you can uh, go on to www. I'll be at the back. You can see it. You can go in there, but, but instead, cut the cut down the, the middleman and go straight in with a wee card. But um, just want to pray for the tithes and offerings. Lord, we want to be faithful to you. We want to line up with your will for victory in these Glasgow for ourselves. So Lord, we thank you that if we give, you will give us back. If we are faithful, you will be faithful to the Lord. So we commit, Lord, all the things, even if it's pennies we give, but no matter the size, Oh Lord, would you multiply that back to us that we may be able to rise in faith and give more and produce more and produce more fruit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Jamie's now coming up to give the announcements. Thank you. Hey, hi family. It's uh, good to see you as all. Um, so the announcements for this week are um, the Victory Journey Discipleship Phase 1 starts today after church at 1pm. Um, this will run for roughly um, 30 minutes. It's in this room and it's open to everyone. These are all welcome. There will be snacks and drinks will be provided. Um, come and learn more about being a disciple of Christ and growing in your faith. Also, um, next week, um, Victory Journey Discipleship Phase 2 starts on Tuesday and that will be on Zoom and that's for the guys that have completed um, Phase 1. Also, next week, um, there's a prayer meeting starting on Tuesday. It will also be on Zoom and it'll be a time we will all be able to come together and seek the Lord. These will be welcome to join that as well. Um, and on the 31st of October, we were having church on the streets, so the service in here will not be happening on the 31st of October. More t details will follow later. And I'm now going to hand it over to Sister Zoe, who's got an announce announcement for the women um, <laughs> when she comes through. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll take it. Sorry. Yeah, once you grab your iPad. <laughs> Let's go. No, uh, you have to do with me. <laughs> Not as good looking as my wife, but you know it's. Uh... Anyway, so what it is is uh, next week Saturday. Next week Saturday, an announcement for the women is that uh, there's going to be a women's discipleship next week Saturday morning at nine a.m. And my wife's going to be doing that. It's going to happen via Zoom. And so after the service today, if you just go see my wife Zoe, I'm sure she'll try and connect with you as well. Uh, that, so next week, Saturday, uh, Discipleship for the Women via Zoom. And so you can see my wife for more information after that. Everybody all right? Yep. Yeah. Great stuff. Right, today, listen, we're going to head into the message this morning. And um, over the last sort, of four, uh, last sort of six weeks, I would say, We've been doing a, a series called the Encounter Series. How many can remember the Encounter Series? We've been doing the Encounter Series. And we had, last week, we had Ricky from Street Connect, and he came and he closed it. That was the last of the series on the Encounter Series. And I just want to also just publicly thank Ricky for last week mm -hmm. for coming and sharing a great message and, and the anointing the presence of God that was here. And it was a great time of ministry as well. So thank you, Ricky and Julie. We, we love you and thank you for your ministry. And, uh, but this week we are starting a brand new series, and it's a series called The Generous Church. The Generous Church. And so I want to just open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll head into the message this morning. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we bring this series before you. We bring your word before you. We bring our hearts before you. We bring, Lord, our minds before you. We ask today, God, that there would be an alignment today. 
of our will and your will, of your will and our will, of your mind and our mind, of your heart and our heart. Lord, that we would be people, God, that don't just see a, a transformation in the area of addiction and transformation in the area, Lord, of, of deliverance and things like that, but we would see transformation in every area and aspect concerning our lives. And so, Lord, today as we begin this brand new series called The Generous Church, Lord, I ask for the anointing ministry of your Holy Spirit. I ask today, my God, that there would be no distance between your will and my words, Lord, that I would speak exactly everything that you have planned for our church today. Lord, as I'm ministering today, Lord, I'm ministering from myself. I'm minister you're ministering to me. I minister from that place. Lord, we thank you today for your word that is holy, it is pure, it is living and it is active. It is, God, the, 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 the line that we live our life. It is, my God, the standard that we live our life. Lord, it is that thing that we attain to and hold on to when everything else around us is shaky and flaky. Lord, your word says that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but your word remains forever. Lord, let your eternal word take its place today in this sanctuary and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wow, that was kind of a pretty deep prayer, that, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> but welcome today, and uh, yeah, just uh, excited just to start this brand new series. And I really believe that, um, that God really wants us to you know, the Bible says, uh, for he who the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. And so we are a, a ministry that believes in, in total freedom, in, in total restoration, in, in total uh, blessing. Not just in the sense of blessing for your health, which is important, but not just blessing in the sense of our freedom from addiction or freedom from drama. How many have had plenty of drama in their life? Come on, somebody say, no more drama. No more drama for your mama. No more drama. But God wants us to, I believe, prosper in every area of our life. And I know sometimes that word prosper can get a bad sort of uh, rap sometimes because uh, certain ministries or certain people have sort of made a, a lifestyle out of preaching about prosperity. But I, I also come to tell you this morning that I don't believe it's God's will, unless it is God's will, that you be poor. That God's will for us is to prosper. That God's will for us is to be blessed as his children. So the world can see God's hand upon our lives. I'm not saying that that means that we get to drive Bentleys and Rolls Royces. I'm not saying you're going to become a multi-millionaire tomorrow. But if you do, remember me. <laughs> <laughs> remember God first, obviously. You know, and if you any left then. However, but God wants us to be blessed. I want you to know that God wants us to be blessed. And one of the areas that I've saw God be so faithful in over the years is the area of our giving. This next four weeks, I'm going to be preaching, teaching actually, probably more teaching these next four weeks um, through this Generous Church series. Amen. It, it, it's going to be a series where we need to listen, where we need to take notes where we need to not just listen, but also apply. Because here's the thing, the Bible is full of promises. I'm the same man. The Bible is full of promises. Amen. It's full of, if you do, I will. Yeah. If you do this, God will do that, right? Yeah. Right? That's it's, it's, it's the Bible. And so one of the areas that God wants us to really uh, prosper in and excel in and grow in is, I believe, in the area of our giving. And so as I start this series today, I want us just to prepare ourselves. Prepare ourselves because I'm probably not going to be shouting and preaching and spitting over the front row these next few weeks, but I want to be teaching and equipping us as a church to receive God's best. This year marks six years of me being an ordained minister. Six years from the time that I passed my minister's license and have been ordained and accredited as a minister of the gospel. In Victor Outreach, we believe in doing things right. We believe in doing things that honor and glorify the Lord. All of our churches internationally and centers, which there are over 600 of them, are led by ordained ministers. Men that go through the process to be licensed and ordained before the Lord. We're not a ministry who ordains people. Uh, we don't get ordained by Google. 
We don't get ordained by, in a, in a sense, online ministry. We don't get ordained by a lucky bag. <laughs> if you can remember them. <laughs> we got ordained because we've been through a process, not just in a sense of learning, but in our character and in our development. It's not just about getting a piece of paper, as anybody who's married will say amen. <laughs> because that piece of paper in itself doesn't, 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 doesn't mean that you got it all together. And so in Victor Outreach, we believe in doing things right. Our churches are led by people that have been equipped and trained for the ministry of the gospel. Over six years ago, I was charged in front of a group of witnesses to preach the whole gospel of the word. The whole council of the word. That was one of the charges that I took when I stood in front of the elder that basically ordained me and anointed me. This statement of the whole counsel of the word comes from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 27. In the ESV, the English Standard Version, it says this, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. This was the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. And what he was saying to the church here was, obviously the Apostle Paul didn't have all the time in the world to break it down from, you know, from, from, from the beginning to the end in the sense of verse by verse. But what he means by this was that as a minister of the gospel, it's our position and our role to declare to you the whole Bible. Amen. Not just the bless me parts, mm -hmm. not just the tickle my feet and tickle my ears parts, mm -hmm. but the whole counsel and the whole revelation of scripture. Yeah. I don't know about you, but listen, if you want a church that's going to tickle your ears and just tell you you're blessed all the time, then you're probably sitting in the wrong place. I believe this series is going to challenge our faith and our culture that we live in. And when the Apostle Paul was talking about the whole counsel of God, he's talking about these things that he would teach the burden of, of God's revelation, the balance of Scripture, leaving nothing out, not just speaking about the easy parts, but also declaring the hard parts. He would not leave anything out, not ducking the, 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 the hard bits and not leaving out the easy bits. But he, his role was to help the believers grasp and understand and comprehend and read the Bible and the word of God themselves so that they could intelligently, comprehensively understand scripture and have a rounded approach, a biblical approach to their lives. As a pastor and as an ordained minister and somebody who's took that charge before witnesses, I also, we also as Victor Outreach, preach and teach the whole counsel of the Lord. Because I can't stand here before you today and tell you that every day you're going to wake up and you're going to feel blessed. I can't tell you that every morning that you wake up you're going to feel like you're saved. Well, I'm talking to some people here. I don't know about you, but even some mornings as a pastor, I wake up and think, am I actually saved? Do I, do I really know God? But I know I do. But as he preached the whole counsel of God, the Apostle Paul, and I'm, 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 I'm sharing this today because I want you guys to see that we're a ministry of values and standards and we believe in God's scriptures. When he talked about the whole counsel of God, it embraced God's purposes for history of redemption, the truths to be believed, and the God that we are to worship. It talks about the, the unpacking of the human origin, of the fall and the redemption and destiny of the human uh, species. It talked about the conduct expected of God's people. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, you're God's people. And let me tell you this morning, regardless of what culture says, there's a conduct <laughs> expected of God's people commandments to be obeyed wisdom to be pursued both in the individual existence and in the community of people of God and also and I love this the pledges of the supernatural transformational power of our God and so when we talk about the whole counsel of God, we're talking about all things from the fall to the redemption, to the plan, to the wisdom, to the Proverbs and the Psalms, to Ecclesiastes from Genesis to Revelation. Some teachings merely just 
Some churches merely just teach New Testament. But it's like watching Police Academy 5 <laughs> without actually watching Police Academy 1. <laughs> it builds up and leads up into it's all one story yeah. of God's plan, His love, His redemption, His grace, His promises. And so today and for the next few weeks, I'm going to be teaching on the area of generous giving. Somebody shout amen. 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 Here's why. Somebody ask me why. why. In the Bible, there's roughly 500 verses that relate to prayer. How many know prayer is important? Wave your hand if you know prayer is important. I want to see what I pray in the church. Online, raise your hand. Raise your leg. Raise your coffee. Something. There's roughly the same number of verses in faith in the scriptures. 500 verses on faith. There are over 2,000 verses biblically that deal and are related to money, finances, and being good stewards. And so it's clearly obvious. I mean, even Stevie Wonder could see this. <laughs> But the Bible has a lot to say in the area of giving. So why is it then that we're scared to talk about it? Why is it then that money makes us funny? Why is it then that money has become such an idol? Not only outside the church, but also within the church. When it's giving time, it's quiet in the room. When it's worship time, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Glory to you, praise, oh Lord, you're worthy, you're worthy. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. When it's giving time, <laughs> it goes real quiet. You start to feel everybody shrivel up like a prune. <laughs> But I believe God wants to take us into a new season. I believe today, and I prayed this, and God showed me, I believe that today marks the beginning of a new season. That for the last two years, we have lived under restrictions. We've lived under constant restrictions in our daily lives. These restrictions have impacted every aspect and sphere of influence in every nation and every city across the world. While we were on lockdown, remember lockdown, remember when we were online, all the churches were online and they were doing some of the services. If they were blessed to have a building, they were doing it in their building with a skeleton staff. But if they were just like us pioneering, just out there on your own, man, we were doing it upstairs in a room. And listen, we created banners, we bought lights, we bought all these different things. Why? Because we still needed to get the word of God out. But while online, although you could see me, we couldn't see you, when it came to the offering section of the service, some of you maybe treated it like the, like the advertisements at the halftime of a football match. That when it's the offering section, I'm going to go get a coffee now. When it was the offering section, or maybe you were like the penguins of Madagascar in the movie. Smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. <laughs> Smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. <laughs> But I can understand that why in lockdown some people would think that we don't need to give. I can understand that. Why do we need to give if we're not having church? There's no outreach, there's no this, there's no ministry taking place. Why should we have to give, right? Maybe you even thought like that. And so today, in the next few weeks, man, I'm going, to, I'm going to share my heart as the minister of this church, and I hope you hear my heart, God's heart through the church. And if I stamp on your toes, I'm sorry. But if your toes are hanging out, they're going to get stamped on. But I can understand why people would think, why should I give? Uh, for instance, we were filming from our bedroom upstairs. So maybe you thought, well, I don't need to give my tithes because they don't have a building to pay for. I don't have to give because there's no lights to pay for, there's no cameras to pay for, there's no evangelism taking place. But little do you know that even through that season, we were still working as pastors. The church was still operating. It was still open. We just weren't in the building. 
We were dropping food parcels off here and flowers off here and ministering to this one and visiting this one. But that season's over. And there's work to do. Even in that season of heavy restrictions and lockdown and all these different things, guess what it did? It only ramped up and intensified the pain. You know right now as we are sitting in God's house this morning, there's people searching on Google right now online, how do I end my life? There's people right now looking through the black market or whatever you call it online, looking how they can buy a 9mm pistol or how they can buy Valium on the black market. Right now there's a son out there eating deadly street Valium right now as we speak, as we sit here. Even right now there's a mother somewhere doing things for drugs that she should never do. There's work to be done. And our conviction as pastors and as a church from God is that we're not called to be a church that just sits back and says, oh well, there goes another one. I was at a funeral on Friday and I was broken for the man, broken for his family. He was a church guy. He came here. He was saved here. He met Jesus here. In this room, me and Charles up the back, the guy was broken, accepting Jesus in his heart. But I was at his funeral on Friday. And I know many churches, man, are scared to talk about finances in case people leave. But if you leave because I talk about finances, then it's probably right that you leave. We're not here to build a great big church of people that are just flaky and shaky. We're here to build a church of people that understand God's plan is for the church to be a mission, to be a hub, to be a Holy Ghost hospital. Where people come and be transformed. I want and I believe, I prayed and I said, God, give me a word for the church this morning. He said, my part, Mark, I want Victory Airways Glasgow to be a church that cannot be explained. Oh, amen. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about look at your neighbour and see how weird they are. <laughs> I'm talking about like, I'm talking about if a visitor walked in here. And they saw what was taking place. They would leave this place and say, you know what? I don't know what's taking place in there, but I can't explain it. Mm-hmm. That there's ex-addicts in there that are now homeowners and, 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 and have a good job. Mm-hmm. That there's ex-prostitutes in there that are getting married and on their feet and living for Jesus. Mm-hmm. There's a church where families are restored. There's a church where addicts are being delivered and set free. It's a church where people are actually employed and come off the benefit system. Right. Amen. My God, imagine that! Imagine if you just believed, if we just believed that God was able to take us off benefits and actually give us a good paying job where we're able to tithe back into the church. I mean, can we even imagine such a thing? Is God able? I mean, can he part the Red Sea? Can he raise the dead? Can he open the eyes? Can he do these things? If God is able to do these things, can we believe in God that he's able to transform and restore and give us a redemption lift? Amen. That once I was broke, but now I'm prosperous. Once I was empty, but now I'm full. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was hopeless, but now I'm... Co- ah. I didn't say I was going to preach today, but hey, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a preacher stroke teacher. But I believe God wants us to be a church that can't be explained. Mm. A church that says, you know what? The foolish things of the world will confound the wise. Yeah. There's some of you in here that are going to be pastors and you don't even realize it yet. There's some of you in here that are going to be a licensed and ordained evangelists for the ministry in here and you don't even realize it. There's some of you in here and watching online that are going to be our worship leader and our backup singer and our keyboardist and somebody that we send into Edinburgh yeah. and Aberdeen and Stirling and Falkirk and Ayrshire. There's people in here that don't even realize That this is going to be a church that cannot be explained. We're going to be a church where people get promoted and not demoted. We're going to be a church where they give back. We're not just here for the take. We're a church that's called to blaze a trail. Not just blaze the pipe. Come on, how many of us want to be part of a church like that? Come on, man, if you're here this morning, you want to be a part of a church that makes a difference, that blazes a trail, 
This different man. I say, you know what, man? I'm different from this culture. I'm different from this generation. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world is this. This is mine. It's all mine. It's all mine. Everything's mine. Nobody's getting any of it. Today, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 13. As you're turning there, I'm just going to pray one more time. Father, today we love your word. Genesis 13, verse 2, start there. We, we love your word. Lord, let today be a day where we become like Abraham. Where we step out in faith and choose to trust you and walk the path of blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're there, say amen. amen. If somebody's there, shout, bring out the book. Amen. Come on, you, do you love the word this morning? Yes. Do you believe in the word? Yes. Is it God's word? Yes. Is it the truth? Yes. Does it work? Yes. Oh, we're quiet there. I'm half ease. We're like, oh, I don't know. I'll tell you next week. <laughs> Genesis 13, verse 2. And we're going to be reading 15 verses. So, you know, we're going to be reading God's word today. Genesis 13, verse 2, New Living Translation says this. Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver and gold. So we're getting a little bit of a backstory here about Abraham. Verse 3, from the Negev, they continued traveling by stages towards Bethel, and they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. <laughs> Let me just pause there for a minute. They pitched their tent where they had camped before. In other words, what happened is, is they parked up in a safe place. They camped out at a safe place. A place where they knew they were going to be safe. I wonder how many of us this morning are camping at a safe place. That we're camping out at a safe place. We live in a safe place. Because we've been safe before. God never called us to live safe. He called us to live saved. Wow. Living a life saved means taking risks. And stepping out in faith. Too many of the church, too many of us, we live camped up in a safe place. Well, I know it's going to be all right because I'm in control. I know where I'm going. I know I might not have a lot of money, but I know that if I keep it all, I'm going to be all right. So when it comes to the giving in a, in a church service, some of us, we listen to the giving. Again, we're like the penguins in Madagascar. Smile and wave, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Just get over, get to the word. <laughs> Why? Because we live in a safe place. And if this offends you, then I'm sorry. Because we're not supposed to live in safe places. I get, yeah, I mean, a nice home and safe and safe environment for our kids. I get that. But not faith. We're not supposed to have a safe faith. We're supposed to have a saved faith. A, 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 faith, a, a salvation of faith. So they had come to at this place. It was a safe place. It was a place they knew before. It was a place they were familiar with. This was the same place where Abraham had built the altar and there they worshipped the Lord again. Verse 5, Lot, who was travelling with Abraham, had also become very wealthy with flocks of sheep and goats and herds and cattle and many tents. Verse 6, but the, land, but the land could not support both Abraham and Lot with all their flocks and herds living so close together. So disputes broke out. I know none of, none of us ever have any disputes in our families. So you, this, you might just have to bypass this section. So disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot. At that time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. Verse 8. Finally, Abraham said to Lot, somebody has to start the healing process first. I'm not sure who this is for this morning, but in family problems and in family breakdowns, somebody has to be the bigger person. Yes. Abraham was that person here in verse 8. Let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we're close relatives. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want and we will separate. If you want the land to the left, then take the land on the left. If you prefer the land to the right, then go to the left. 
Then I'll go to the left. Lord, take a long time to look over the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like a garden, like the garden of the Lord, which was what she meant, the, the Garden of Eden, or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself. Somebody say he chose for himself. The whole Jordan Valley to the east. Somebody say, say east. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. Verse 12. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom. Somebody say that's too close. And settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. This is the place where Lot chose. This is the place where Lot chose to live his life. He never actually moved to Sodom. So couldn't he technically be, you know, found in there? But he moved so close to Sodom that he could travel in and out on a regular basis. You see, some of us, we live our life like that. Sodom represents sin. It represents lusts. It represents pleasure. And although we don't physically live in Sodom, we park so close to it. And we live so close to it when grace is given not to get so close, grace is given to get so far. Come on. I think some of us could learn a lesson from this today that grace doesn't mean you can get so close to sin and just flicker around with it. Grace means you've been given the power to stay away as far as you can from it. And so you can say, well, I, I keep slipping back into sin. Yes, move away from Sodom then. But I keep getting tempted. Yeah, but you won't get tempted if you move away. Don't worry, I'm getting to the end of the scripture here. Sorry, there's just so much in the scripture. The people were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abraham, Look as far as you can see in every direction. North, south, east. Somebody say east. east. And west. I am giving you all this land and as far as you can see to you and your descendants. Somebody say descendants. descendants. As a parent possession I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth they cannot be counted go and walk through the land in every direction for I am giving it to you Abraham was known as a father of faith in the previous chapter Genesis chapter 12 we see that God calls Abraham to up sticks and move watch this he doesn't give him a destination he just says listen I want you to go and when you get there I'll tell you <laughs> Woo. I mean, at least when me and Zoe got launched out here, we knew where we were coming. <laughs> like when we stepped out in faith, we knew we were coming to Glasgow. Imagine the Lord just saying, hey, you know what? Uh, tomorrow, uh, I want you just to get up and go. And when you get there, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's faith. He stepped out in faith and he trusted God. And what we see in Abraham is a man that exhibits a life of trust and faith. Always placing God first and also placing others before Himself. How many know that scripture? The Bible says to love God and to love our neighbor. Mm -hmm. To place others before ourselves. Abraham had a relaxed confidence in God. And we can see that, watch this, by the way that he deals with Lot. In verses number 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9 says this. Finally, Abraham says to Lot, this is after the conflict. This is after they've grown too big for the land. Finally, Abraham said to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we're close relatives. This whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land. Here you can sense Abraham's complete trust and faith in God. But even if he releases this part, God will take care of him. He said, if you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land on the right. And if you prefer the land on the right, then I'll go to the left. Abraham's like, listen, look, look. I, basically, I, you take whatever you want. 
Because when I know, when I place God first and humbling myself, when I know that I place others before myself, Lord, you take your pick. I know when I place God first and place my neighbors before me, I know that God's going to take care of me. I know that if I just release that to you, if I release the best to you, Abraham had a faith that believed that God was able to meet every single need that he had. I want to encourage you this morning, whatever you release to God first, God will take care of the rest. Here's today's sermon in a sentence. You'll never come second by placing God first. You will never become second by placing God first. Abraham was a man who exhibited confidence and trust in God. He placed God first by allowing this man, his nephew, to take pick. He placed his nephew first, command, obeying the command to love his neighbor. He put every person before himself and released unto God. And we see later on that God was able to give Abraham back more than he released. Abraham's relaxed attitude was down to his confidence and his faithfulness and his trust in God. But Lot, on the other hand, well, let's have a look at Lot's life. Genesis 13, verse 10 to 11. Lot took a long time, a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zohar. The whole area was well watered, like the garden of the Lord or a beautiful land of Egypt. Lot chose for himself. Somebody say he chose for himself. Lot chose for himself the whole valley to the east. Somebody say the east. I'm saying these things because I wanted to get them in because we're going to see them in. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abraham. Abraham gives Lot the choice. Lot, take your pick. Everywhere you see is open to you. The Bible says here he took a long look. So he measured everything up. He's looking to the left. He's looking to the right. He's looking all around. And he's looking for the greenest area he can find. Mm. He's looking for the green grass. He, he's looking for the easy option. Is this on, Stephen? Yeah? <laughs> he's looking for the carnal, selfish yeah. decision that blesses him. Yeah. Yeah. Here's why you know he's selfish. In Genesis 12, when Abraham left to go where God would show him, Abraham was 75. Which means by the time we come to this portion of scripture here, Abraham must be 90 odd. Here's why we can tell that Lot's selfish. When a 90 odd year old man says, hey, you pick first, what would be your reply? No, you go first. So we can see that there was a carnal side of selfishness in the life of Lot. He was greedy. And he chose the easy route, the carnal route, the green grass. He, he went there to look to the green grass because he thought it's green over there. And it looks like it's lush already, so I don't have to do much over there. How many know the green the grass isn't always greener on the other side? As we see. But when we continue to read about Lot's life, the interesting thing is this, is Lot, all the way through scripture, was always needing to be rescued. In Genesis 14, we see that he was, uh, that he was abducted. And, uh, and, and Abraham went to rescue his nephew. The nephew who was selfish, who chose the easy way, who chose the painless way. 
He, he, he rescued in Genesis chapter 14. And Abraham went to rescue him. And Abraham rescued him. And God recovered him. And then God then, uh, Abraham then met a man named Melchizedek. It was at this place in Genesis 14, after Lot, his nephew, had been recovered and the family had been recovered, that Abraham offered up a 10% offering to Melchizedek. The offering of 10% of the tithe, which means tenth, came not from a place of law, but from a place of gratefulness for all God had recovered in his life. Some people say, well, the tithe is a law. No, it's not. The tithe came before the law. Right. Now, the tithe is Old Testament. Well, Jesus does talk about it in Matthew. Mm -hmm. But if tithe was law, if 10% was, if 10 was law back then, how much more is it in grace? That's right. Remember his decision to camp near Sodom and Gomorrah? He needed rescuing in Genesis 14. In Genesis 18, he needed rescuing again. Guess where from? Sodom. The selfish choice that he made, he needed rescuing again. He needed rescuing again from his selfish carnal decisions. And guess what? He, not just him that needed rescuing. Every time you make a selfish carnal decision, watch this, you're putting your whole family at risk. Yes. His decision to go for the green grass, his decision to go to Sodom, ended up putting his whole family at risk. In Genesis 19, we see that he needed rescuing again. Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and in Genesis 19 we know the story where fire and brimstone came down from heaven and what happened to Lot's missus? Turned into Saul. His decision which was carnal and fleshy led to his wife being turned into a pillar of salt in Genesis 19. I want to let you know this morning, listen, that your decisions may not affect you right We may think that we're getting away with it right now. But the consequences of his decisions came in chapters later. Whereas Abraham's life was built around trust and confidence in God's provision, we see that Abraham started a family. That God blessed him with a son. And he became the father of many nations, in fact, which we are descendants of. Amen. Abraham secures his family's destiny, future. And also prepares and provides for the next generation. Abraham's decision was, Lord, you go first, you choose. I know that God has my back. Whatever I release, God will bless me. Lord, you take your selfish decision. You take your carnal. You take your easy choice. You take the greener route. You go live near sin as long as you like. But that place is your family. And your future, future at risk. Wow. Save it off. I'm not getting many amens today, but that's all right. Amen. Abraham modeled a faith that brought with it a, a, a provision and a protection from God. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6 says this, Better is a handful of, of quietness than two handfuls of toil. I'm going to read that again. There is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil. Better to have a small hand, a small lot, better to be generous with what you have and just have a, a good little hand here and know that you've blessed God, you've blessed people, you've blessed your church, you've blessed others. 
But you can lie in your bed and put your head in the pillow at night time and say, God, I've, I've, I've blessed you. I, I've gave my best. I've done my best. I, I'm all right, God. I know that I've met the needs and I've, I've blessed this and I've looked after that and I've honored you first. Or oh, you can lie and put your head in the pillow at night time and worry. It's mine. Where's my money going to come from? But when we're able and free to release, here's the thing. Do we really tr believe that Philippians 4.19 says this? But my God will supply all my needs. If we really believe that my God will supply all my needs, then what we get comes from my God. And so to bless him and to bless others and to bless the church and to be part of the mission and the transformation that takes place within the city. Listen, me and my wife, we don't have loads of money, but we're blessed. We got a beautiful house, we got a beautiful car, we know we, we got we got three beautiful children, we pastor an amazing church. Honestly, I think you guys are the best if Carol's parents did churches. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are pretty amazing. But we're blessed, man. You know my wife and I we've we've given. From the very moment we came through the recovery home, we gave our tithes, we gave offerings, we gave pledges, we've paid bills for people that people don't even know about. We've went and done different things that nobody even knows about. And guess what? God always takes care of us. Let's stand this morning, this afternoon. Let's stand. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verses 25, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Stephen, come back and just play softly. And so today I'm talking about generous, being generous, being of a generous spirit. You see, the thing about generous is the last two letters in generous is U.S., which means us. If you have that slide. You have that slide? Generous. No, no, no. No? No. Cool. I just have to explain it. <laughs> the generous church. The last two letters in generous is U-S. Us. Go back to verse 11. I'm going to finish up with this today. Remember in verse 11, the Bible says that Lot chose to himself, which direction? East, east, east. east. Some of you guys are listening, praise the Lord. You guys are going to be pastors next, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Remember in verse 11, Lot chose for himself the east. But let's read verse 14, if we can have verse 14 up there. Yep. After Lot had gone, basically, after Abraham had blessed Lot, and Lot had chose himself, and he had gone, the Lord says to Abraham, Look, as far as you can see in every direction, watch this, north, south, east, and west, I am giving you all this land. Abraham released the east. And God gave him back the north, the south, the east. And the West. You see, when we place God first and we release our best, God is able to give us back that plus much more. I want to speak to us today just as we kind of come to a close right now in this. Some of us, we live in that safe place. And I mean that in our giving and in our faith. And I'm not here today to to twist your arm, I'm here to show you through scripture what happens when you place God first. That Abraham placed God first in giving Lot the east and God gave back Abraham north, south, east and west. So what does that tell us? 
that when we release to God, he's able to provide every need. He's able to give us back that which we've given and much, much more. But some of us, we stand at that place today, that safe place. We camp at that safe place. Every time giving gets mentioned, you know, you wait, smile and wave, but every time giving gets mentioned, it's always like a fork in the road. It's kind of like that great song comes back from that band, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Which way do I go? Do I stick on the safe route that I've always stuck on? Well, at least I know what I have. Better the devil you know. Or do you take the other route that says, Hey, you know what? I, God, I, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm just going to do something crazy. I'm actually going to trust you. I'm actually going to actually do what the Bible says and place my faith and trust in you. I'm actually going to do it. If this is your church, online and in person, if you say, this is my church, this is where I, I get fed, this is where I meet with God. This is where my family are. This is where I see God has me. And I want to encourage you to tithe. Hebrews said that it was at that place where Abraham, in the faith chapter, was where he gave 10%. And so he does I'm not here today to raise money. So, Because guess who the blessing comes to? Not me. I don't get blessed when you give. It blesses me that you give. Why? Because I will see the blessing on you. You give up your east. I'll watch God give you back the north, the south, the east, and the west. You give, you give God your east. I'll watch God promote you. I'll watch God give you a pay rise. I'll watch God give you, I'll watch God bless you and I'll celebrate with you when you step in faith. Let's close our eyes for a moment. Lord, we want to be a generous church. A church, my God, that's able to be at the forefront and at the heartbeat of what's taking place within our city and nation. A church, my God, that's able, Lord, to look to the storehouse of Malachi chapter 3. A church, my God, that is able to look at the storehouse when there's a need. It says, oh, there's, 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 there's tithe in the storeroom. When a family needs something, when a, a brother or a sister needs a blessing, when somebody needs food. We're able to look to the storehouse and we're able to bless. That is the purpose of the storehouse is that it's a blessing in the time of need. Lord, I pray today that as I've ministered your word, my God, that it's, I know it's not been an easy listen probably for some, probably for some in this place you are like the penguins of Madagascar and you're thinking, I'm just looking for the coffee right now. I'm being serious. You think, yeah, he's talking to somebody else? No, I'm talking to you with a stubborn heart. Well, I give to bars my dogs home. Yeah, but dogs don't go to heaven. If God, if God was to look at our bank accounts today, would God see where our priority lies? Would God look at our bank accounts? Would God see where our priority lies? Would, would God see how much we give to Netflix and gym and Sky Sports, Costa Coffee, Starbucks? Lord, would God see how much we give to all of them and would God see how little we give to him? Again, Lord, I'm not here to convince or to convict anybody. I'm here as a minister to say let us be a church that places God first in every area of our life Amen. I'm telling you 
the windows of heaven will be released and a blessing. The Bible says in Malachi 3 verse 10, it talks about the tithe. He says, trust me in this, try me in this. It's the only place in scripture that God says, try me in this and see that I will pour a blessing upon you that you will not able to contain. So Lord, today, God, as we sing this song, I pray today that we would look to you, God, in a fresh way today. That we would look to our giving. That we would look to the condition of our heart. Lord, that we would maybe assess our giving and assess what we give to and assess what we spend our time on. And hopefully, God, by your grace, that some would be pulled closer into a relationship today. Lord, we're not a prosperity ministry, but we do leave, believe in prosperity by God. We do believe in the tithe. We do believe, God, that when we give to you, there's a blessing upon that tithe and there's always also protection upon the rest. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be a generous church. And it starts with us. Hallelujah. Take a moment just to be in the presence of the Lord right now. If you know there's more you can give, if you know you've not been giving, if you need to repent and ask God for forgiveness right now, then let's do it just now. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Show yourself strong and in 